All right, well, um, so this is part two, but it doesn't matter if you missed part one. So yesterday I talked about sort of the overall role that algorithms play in our information ecosystem. I didn't really talk about any of the individual algorithms, just that they create some misinformation, they propagate it, they detect it, they can help mitigate it. But now I want to focus more on kind of empowering education, meaning I want to actually zoom in and use a little bit of math. Don't worry, it'll be painless a little bit of math to just kind of explore how a tiny bit of insight into these algorithms can really empower you to sort of start controlling them instead of just sitting back idly and letting them control you. And one of the, the slogans that showed up on the, the manifesto that Jeanette just showed uh, was something like, algorithms are responsible for this, who owns the technology? And that particular quote perfectly sets the stage for this because you know, whether or not algorithms are fully or partially responsible, they definitely play a prominent role. And this question of who owns the technology, the easy answer is them, the big tech companies, mostly American tech companies. But you don't have to sit back. You don't have to just let them have total control and sort of hegemony over you. You can, with a little bit of insight, start to kind of fight back and take a little bit of control of the algorithms. So even though the tech companies own the technology, you can still play a slightly more prominent role. OK, so most of the math is early on, so just bear with me. It'll get lighter as we go. So uh, a year or so ago, Facebook revealed in a company blog post the key equation behind their newsfeed algorithm. And if you don't use Facebook, don't worry. I'm going to all the social media platforms will come up soon. This is the equation I'm about to show you. I want to build some suspense. I'm not going to show you yet. These algorithms are kind of have this air of complexity, and you, know, you have to have a PhD in computer science to understand them and everything. That's what they want you to think. The truth is the one equation I'm about to show you is really the, the key insight. It's not all the details. You won't be able to implement these algorithms on your own computer, but it doesn't matter. This is how the Facebook newsfeed work algorithm works. And by the algorithm, I mean the, the system that decides which posts you see and what order when you log in. That's it. What the heck does that mean? I'll tell you. Take, you know, give me a minute. So the subscript I here is just an index. Basically, that's just telling you which particular post we're interested in. So let's pretend I'm a user. I log into my Facebook account. And there's thousands of posts I could be shown, namely all the friends that I'm, all the people I'm friends with, all the groups that I'm part of, all the various things that I follow everything that they've produced since my last login or since some recent time period, that's this pool of thousands of posts I could be shown. All the algorithm has to do is order these from one, let's say there's a thousand of these, order it from one to a thousand. So think of that index i as ranging from one to a thousand, and we're just going to go through each of these thousand posts, and we're going to compute this sum here. What are all the things in the sum? Well, the other number you see there, one, two, three, dot, 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 all the way up to k, those are the different types of engagement you can do. On Facebook, that means a like or a love, the little heart emoji, a ha ha, an angry face. Could be a comment. Turns out Facebook even separates short comments from long comments. They don't tell you that, but behind the scenes, the algorithm does this, a share. So these are all the things you can do. Remember, we talked about how social media algorithms are engagement-based. These are the engagements that are possible on Facebook. On Twitter, they are, I don't know what it's called, but basically a like and a retweet or a reply. OK, so let's go a little deeper. The P there is probability. So let's just say we're starting with the first post. So pretend I is 1. So what we look at is the probability that I will like the first post, the probability that I will love the first post, that I will ha-ha react to the first post, the probability that I will comment on the first post, the probability that I will share the first post. Compute all those probabilities. That's where deep learning. Um, you know, this AI machine learning stuff, that's where all the actual kind of mathy algorithmic stuff comes in, is estimating those probabilities. Don't worry about it. Don't lose a second thinking about it. That's what the computers do. Let's just say there's some probability. Maybe I have a 10% chance of liking this, a 5% chance of, of sharing it. Don't worry about where the numbers come from. That's what they have all your data for, is to guess this. All right, the only other thing I haven't told you here are the Ws. Those are weights. Those are things that we don't have any control over. Facebook's engineers, maybe Mark Zuckerberg himself, who knows, decides. Think of those as points. What happens is, and the, the total sum that we get here, this is called a weighted sum, is called the value. So here's the whole algorithm in a nutshell. 
out of these thousand posts that I'm supposed to consider that I could potentially be shown in some order, Facebook will go through and compute for each post. So let's say I'm just looking at one particular post. It'll compute the probability to like, share, comment, love, you know, all these different probabilities. And it'll multiply each of those by a weight. Just think of those as number of points. So it turns out that Facebook gives liking a one point. It gives love five points. Originally gave angry reaction five points. But it turned out, as I'll explain in a minute, that that led to a sort of propagation of content that made people angry, so they actually lowered it to zero. It wasn't supposed to be valuable to people. A uh, comment is worth 30 points, and a share was worth something like 30 points. They never published this information. This formula was in the public blog post, so that's information they want us to have. The exact numbers of those weights, those scores I'm describing, that only came out in the leaked documents by Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower. So they didn't want us to know it, but haha, we have it now. OK, so for all of these different posts, you add up all these things, so maybe if there's a 10% chance that I'm going to um, like a post, that's worth a tenth of a point. And if there's a 5% chance that I'm going to love a post, then it's 5% times, uh, what did I say, five points. So you go through and you get the sort of weighted sum of points, the probability times the point score. And you get some number of points for each post and you add those up. And all the algorithm does, other than some minor tweaks that's not worth worrying about, they don't want to show you like, too many videos in a row, so they try to mix things up. But basically, that's all they do. They just sort the post by the value. So whatever post has the most value, meaning the this, this sum of, kind of weighted points adds up to the most, is the post you'll see the first. And then it proceeds. Why is it helpful to know this? Well, here's my favorite example. Let's say you see some content of misinformation. We heard earlier about something like COVID misinformation was very rampant on social media. If you see a piece of, of COVID misinformation, doesn't matter if it's from a news source, a fake news source, or your conspiracy theory loving uncle, if you see a, com a post like that, you have a temptation, a lot of us do, to write a comment to try to debunk it and explain it's wrong. But think about what happens in terms of this formula. A comment is worth 30 points. If you comment on misinformation, you are providing the algorithm 30 points, basically saying, I am very enthusiastic about this content. Please show me more. 30 points. What else could you do? Well, now that the weight of the angry score has been reduced to zero, guess what? If you put an angry reaction, that's a way of maybe publicly signaling to your uncle that you don't like this, and yet it gives zero value to that post. So, this is what I mean by a little bit of math and a little bit of insight helps you start to control it. Facebook and all these companies want you to just sit back and let the formula and the algorithm do its thing. But if you just know a little bit about it, you can kind of stand up and start to kind of, you know, we can't change the weights, we can't change much about Facebook, but you can just have a little bit more control over the algorithm. Uh, so that's one example with misinformation, but just being mindful that every action you do on these platforms is sending a signal telling the algorithm how it will act with you in the future. Every comment, every like, every share is providing some point score to whatever type of post you're looking at. The algorithm will then see how many points you're giving things, and it'll provide you more things with more points. So if you don't like something and you don't want to see it, do not give it points. And this formula explains exactly how the points are added up. There are some more details, so let's not worry about this. Facebook, for instance, can adjust the weights of things like political content. So you, unfortunately, can't control that. But Facebook, when it wants to, can lower the, the point scores on political posts, so we all see less politics. Turns out they did that at one point, I think, before a recent election, and everyone's happier. And as soon as the election was over, they cranked the score back up, and we all started hating each other. We can't help it, but just knowing that's happening is a little useful. OK, let me give you an anecdote. I'm right now teaching a first-year university student. So all my students are about 18 years old. And I was basically explaining this in class. And I thought it was going well. And I asked the students, raise your hand, how many of you use Facebook? Zero. The one student did raise his hand. I saw a hand go up here. And I said, oh, you use it. He said, no, I just my parents use it. <laughs> he don't even heard of Facebook. Not just they didn't use it, they've only heard of it because their parents use it. So what do they use? Some Instagram, which, as you know, is owned by the same parent company as Facebook. Guess what? Instagram has never published a blog post like this, and I, don't, I haven't seen the leaked documents. I would be willing to wager money that they use the same formula. 
Twitter, I'd be willing to bet that they use the same formula. There is one other company that did reveal, actually they didn't reveal, it was also leaked, the sort of main math formula behind their platform, which is TikTok. Thankfully, because that is the one that young people use. So, do you want to know the secret formula behind TikTok? Ready? Or should I build suspense? It's the same formula. It's exactly the same formula. TikTok, this fantastic new platform that everybody loves, Facebook, this old stodgy thing that your parents use, they have the exact same formula. I didn't explain this as, in as much detail, but the same thing for every video, and here instead of the thousands that you've kind of selected through your friend network, it's the billions that are on the platform, there's of course some more technical details, but this is the formula. TikTok goes through, and for each video, it computes the probability that you'll like the video, multiplies it by some weight, some point score, for which we don't know, but they have internally. The probability you'll comment on a video, and again a point score. The probability that you'll play the video, and the only slight difference is the last one, is they need some kind of score for how much you watch it. So instead of the probability that you'll watch, which is already in the play, it's the expected play time. Anytime you have a random variable, there's something called the expected value. So think of that as sort of your average, or basically it's prediction for how long you'll play the video. Everything has a point score, so I don't know any of the weights for TikTok, they didn't reveal this. This was published in a New York Times article that was some employee sort of leaked this, so they never intended to reveal this. Isn't this amazing though? Facebook and TikTok have the exact same formula. I strongly believe that basically all social media, at least, you know, not maybe Reddit's different, but all engagement-based social media uses this formula. It's just a weighted sum. Point scores associated to the various things you can do on the platform, times probabilities that you'll do those things, add it up, and whatever gets the highest score is what you see. So this doesn't mean you can fully control these platforms, but again, a little bit goes a long way. And some of this is kind of intuitive, you might do this already. So for instance, my wife says that she really likes Instagram, and I was saying, I read all these things about you know, it being bad for teens' health and body image, and she showed me her Instagram, and it's just pictures of fluffy dogs. And I said, what, what's going on? She said, well, I trained the algorithm. Every time she sees a dog picture, she likes it. And anything else, like political, anything, self-esteem, just scrolls right past. She didn't need this formula, and you don't need it either, and you don't have to always think of point scores. But this is why that works. You can train the algorithm. If you don't, it will train you. It'll control you, it'll manipulate you. You can now manipulate the algorithm to some extent, to a very limited extent. I don't want to be overly optimistic. They still own the technology to refer back to that manifesto item. But you have a little bit of input into it. OK, so that's all the math I needed, right? Multiplying and adding. You've been doing that since you're little. It's not that hard. And yet, that's the key math behind all social media, as far as I can tell. All right, so the next one, I'm not going to use math, but I do want to mention a mathematical concept, a very simple thing, but I think it's crucial. And this is another example of how I think a little bit of education into the algorithms can go a long way towards mitigating misinformation, not in the sense of making it not spread, but in the sense of making people less susceptible to it. So I'm going to share a tiny little insight that might seem obvious or it might not. I'll see if you enjoy it. If you do, please tell your friends and share it, and let's see if we can kind of convince more people this little fact. Which is, what happens when you go to Google, you know, 95% of the world uses Google to, to find information about everything. Even Wikipedia, right? I never search Wikipedia. I Google, and then I type wiki or Wikipedia. We all use Google for basically everything. And even if you're not using Google, other search algorithms are similar. OK, what happens when you start typing? You start to get these sort of autocompletes. It, it suggests things you could type. Well, it turns out that these are not technically suggestions. If you look at Google's official web page, it describes these as predictions. That may seem like a tiny pedantic distinction, but I think it's actually enormously important. What's the difference? A suggestion is saying, you should look for these things. That if you're starting to type, why did Malta, that you should consider these various searches. Google claims that that's not what they're doing. It claims that it's doing predictions. Meaning, among all the, based on your personal data, based on what other people around the world are searching, that if someone starts to type, why did Malta, that the most likely subsequent words in order are join the EU, become a republic, not join the EU, etc. So this is not saying you should do this search. It's saying based on your personal data and everyone else's search history, these are the most likely searches. Tiny pedantic distinction, and yet I think it matters. Let's look at why. So to me, these seem innocuous enough. Why did Malta? And I get these various autocompletes, which again are predictions. 
I tried changing, I just, just did this a couple days ago, I tried changing one word in this. So let me change it from why did Malta to why is Malta. Let me just notice. It's funny, but I think it's also kind of horrifying and depressing. This is, I did this in the US before I came here. That means around the world, if someone just innocently types why is Malta, they'll be left with the impression that Malta is a dirty tax haven. <laughs> this, I think, is enormously important. I mean, I'm glad you're laughing. I thought you might be insulted, but you're probably both. What's happening is, just because other people asked that question, they typed into Google, why is Malta these various things, Google then says, okay, there's these various probabilities. But you can see the problem. People now around the world are going to start typing, why is Malta, and who knows what, they're gonna, what they have in mind. As soon as they type those words, an algorithm comes and puts words in their mouth. And people often don't even do these searches, they assume they have some kernel of truth. It really is hard to see this list and not, we don't question, is Malta dirty and rich in a tax haven? When you see this, because of the way it's worded, you just say, oh, it is those things. I'm curious why it's dirty. And then you click, and maybe you'll get some blog post to some tourist who went and complained or something. But I think this is extremely dangerous and destructive, and I wish Google didn't do this. I can't stop Google from doing it, but hopefully we can inoculate ourselves. So when you are using Google and you start to see these things, just remind yourself, these are not suggestions of searches you should do. They are predictions. These are not truths, these are not statements, these are not pieces of information. This is merely a probabilistic estimation based on what you and other people have searched in the past. This is what people are, have typed into Google, not any bearing on reality, not any bearing on the truth. So you don't even need any math, right? I didn't have a formula for that. And yet that tiny little bit of insight that takes you know, three minutes to explain, I think if we could kind of encourage especially youth to just be aware of that, it'll stop a lot of uh, miscomprehensions about the world that Google is unfortunately peddling. And I just want to give you one, unfortunately, quite horrific example of, of what we believe happened due to this. So in uh, 2015, this uh, white supremacist, I think he was a teenager, quite young, Dylan Roof, uh, murdered nine black people in a church in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. After they caught him, the FBI was interviewing and trying to understand what the heck was going on. He also had one of these crazy manifestos that shooters often write, both in the manifesto and in the FBI interviews. He said, I decided to look up his name, Trevon Martin. Look up the name Tr Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin, for context, was a black teenager that was just walking around in Florida wearing a hoodie. One of his neighbors, a white neighbor, was on the neighborhood watch, saw a black kid in a hoodie, and assumed that he was doing something troublesome, and ended up shooting and killing him. So it was a horrific crime. It was before the Black Lives Matter movement, but it was very much the type of event that triggers those things, uprisings. Um, the guy who, the white guy who killed Trayvon Martin claimed that he was threatened and he did this out of self-defense. It was this whole horrific thing. But the manifesto that Dylan Roof wrote and what he talked about was he claimed that he had looked up some statistics uh, about black on white crime of, you know, black people robbing and murdering white people, and he was horrified, and this kind of inspired him to become this white supremacist because he realized that black people are doing all these things to white people. Where did he get these ideas? How did he... First of all, we sh who knows, and we shouldn't trust a word he says because he's, you know, a murderer. Why give him any credit? But it's interesting just to see what he did say. He literally said, I decided to look up Trayvon Martin's name, type him into Google, you know what I'm saying? I read the Wikipedia article for Martin, and then for some reason, after I read that, I typed in, for some reason, it made me type in the words black and white crime. And that was it ever since. He got radicalized, or he claims he got radicalized, basically from a, a toxic Google search. We don't know exactly what he means by it made me type in, but it sure sounds like, and people have this running theory, that he started to type some words into Google to get information, and Google auto-completed with this statement about black on white crime. At the time, in 2015, when you did that Google search, the top results were disgusting neo-Nazi propaganda that claimed that there was this epidemic of black and white crime and that white people need to defend themselves, and that's, that's how he came at this. Since then, Google got in a lot of trouble for this, and they've adjusted their algorithms, so now the top result you get is authentic government data that actually shows, guess what? There's more white on black crime than black on white crime. The whole thing was just complete bullshit, and yet it might have played a role in this horrific murder. 
So I don't know if this really was Google autocomplete, but it, and I'm sorry to end on this you know, horrifying, tragic note, but I just want to say information matters tremendously. And when algorithms nudge us in directions, if they suggest things, this can have enormous consequences. It's really important to be aware of the algorithm doing this, to not just say, like, for some reason it made me type into the words, but to just say, that's some bullshit probability. I can do that search if I want. I don't have to. I'm empowered to decide what I search, what I look at, what I engage with on social media. I can stand up to some extent. We don't own the technology, but we can take ownership of the tiny piece of technology that we're using to the extent that's possible. Thank you.